Hello and welcome to SUMAS webinar. My name is Alisa and I'm an Associate Director of Student Recruitment here at SUMAS. Uh, today we'll be speaking about the sustainable hospitality and this is the topic that is at the core of SUMAS values. We strongly believe that sustainability must become an obligation and not a choice in, a, in hospitality industry and that the values of nature conservation and biodiversity must be the priority for the industry as well. Our guest professor, Andre Harms, uh, is an expert in the field. Uh, he is a sustainability engineer at the Hotel Verde, uh, the greenest hotel in Africa, and he will share his insight on the topic, uh, which will hopefully inspire you, uh, future sustainability experts, to make further change to the sustainability. At the end of the webinar, I will uh, tell you more about the SUMAS and our sustainable hospitality programs. Uh, you will be muted for the duration of the session. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat. Um, then at the end, uh, Andre will answer also some of the questions that you will ask. We we'll probably won't have time to answer all of them, but we'll try our best. Um, also, please note that this webinar is being recorded. So now I'll leave the virtual floor to Andre uh, and uh, enjoy the webinar. Good. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege to spend the morning with you. Yeah, so I get to talk to you about sustainability and hospitality. I've got uh, a, a somewhat of an experience in that field, um, and I've broken it up into three sections, energy, water and waste. I'll talk a little bit of theory about each of them before diving into the case study that is Hotel Verdi, um, based here in Cape Town, South Africa. So I just wanted to briefly locate why um, buildings are so important in the sustainability efforts around the globe across all industries. And as you can see in this graphic over here, buildings make up a, a massive contributor to, to um, greenhouse gases. And as you can see by the color coding, orange is uh, the low cost emission reduction opportunities, where light blue is medium cost and dark blue is high cost. So we actually have a really large amount of or large percentage of low cost emission reduction opportunities in the building sector, making it a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to drive towards decarbonizing our various economies and, and industries. Then uh, another factor why buildings are so important and why the hotel industry or the hospitality industry specifically is so important because buildings make up a massive proportion of um, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels and the hospitality sector or the accommodation sector is, a, is such a large user, uh, manager and owner of buildings. It's, it goes without saying um, that we have, again, a massive opportunity and a massive obligation to, to play our part. Good. So diving briefly into energy management, um, just a couple of statistics to, to get us going. About 50% of hotel energy consumption goes into space heating, ventilation, air conditioning. If we add lighting and water heating to that, we're looking at about 75%, so a massive uh, proportion. Hot water on its own, about 15%, and lighting uh, up to about 18% of uh, induced energy consumption in hotels. Good. I'm introducing a brief, uh, briefly a, a topic, uh, and that is the energy and water nexus. Even though we're talking here in this section about energy, um, I just wanted to make the point that those two are very inextricably linked. And, and what I'm showing on the screen here is a campaign by Greenpeace uh, in South Africa looking at the, the large consumers of water in our economy and found that actually our, um, our monopoly uh, energy supply, ESCOM, is by far the biggest consumer of energy. And, and for that reason, um, uh, we can see that the, the energy and water nexus is so inextricably linked in most um, countries, not just here in South Africa. Um, for every unit of energy that is produced in South Africa, 1.4 uh, liters of uh, water is consumed. Um, and then on the, on the inverse side, we can also envisage that the pumping of water consumes energy, uh, that the treatment of water consumes energy, that the treatment of wastewater consumes energy, and also that the heating of water consumes energy as well. So, so consuming energy has a large impact on water consumption and vice versa, consuming water has a large impact on energy cons consumption. Um, I just like to, to make sure that all of you keep that in mind as we proceed through, 
through this morning's presentation um, that the one really has impacts on the other. Okay, then um, another bit of theory to, to locate uh, various interventions and technologies on a responsible sustainability or energy efficiency journey. Um, we believe and advocate that uh, implementing energy efficiency in buildings and the hospitality sector shouldn't just consist of high-tech technologies, shouldn't just consist of, uh, for example, renewable energy like photovoltaic systems on the roof, but rather should be a holistic approach. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here with this pyramid, um, that if we focus on the basic building designs like the orientation, the form factor, um, as well as passive interventions like shading, the right insulation, uh, natural ventilation, um, then our demand on systems uh, that in turn consume energy is greatly reduced. Then the next step would be to make sure that the mechanical and electrical equipment that we specify or, or have in our building is as efficient as possible. And lastly, we could look at bolstering our energy supply with alternative energy sources. Um, just wanted to locate a, a journey of sustainability here. Okay, so there's, um, there's obviously uh, um, a big difference in the energy intensity of different kinds of hotels um, that can be categorized in, in matters of size, um, classification, luxury, a number of rooms, the customer profile, whether it's a business or, or leisure traveler, the location, is it rural, urban, the climate zone, all of those aspects um, drive energy consumption in, in a big way and is important uh, for, for anyone that wants to make energy improvements um, in one's hospitality facility to uh, be aware of these factors. Good, then, then um, if one is to, to embark on an energy management program, uh, it's vital to first establish exactly how much energy is being used, where and in, in what way. So we first want to understand um, where the energy consumption is before we simply go ahead and, and um, you know, implement interventions, uh, shooting from the hip, if you will. So just a brief background, the hotel can be subdivided into three major zones, uh, the guest room areas, uh, the public areas, and back of house or service areas. So an energy audit um, is something that we usually advocate for to help with an understanding of uh, what energy is being consumed, how much, where, and, and why, what the drivers are. And based on that, an energy consumption goals can be set and implementation uh, and action plan would be the next step. All right, a bit about energy efficiency technology. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just a, uh, before we dive into actual technologies and, and the case study for Hotel Verdi, I just want to make the point here that there is a delayed mitigation effect from implementing a new more energy efficient technology that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, for example, uh, you know, the, the extraction, the manufacture, the transport and installation impact, each of which uh, consume resources and have energy attached to that step of the process and perhaps also water consumption attached to that step of the process have to first be um, mitigated by the improved efficiency during the operation or during the service life of that component. Um, so simply because the energy bill of the facility would be reduced from day one of implementing these interventions, the overall um, sustainability or, or energy footprint picture is not quite uh, as simple. And I just again want to highlight that as a conceptual point for anyone that's embarking in, in driving sustainability in the hospitality sector. Uh, these are a couple of uh, interventions we could look at, especially given that we, we uh, learned earlier that HVAC is such a big consumer in hotels. Um, intelligent room functions are a big driver uh, also because the, the guest room is a big consumer of energy. Uh, daylight and electric lighting and then common sense in, in energy management and a couple of points regarding that. So there is a big misconception that um, the bulk of energy can only be saved by installing advanced high-tech, uh, high maintenance and really expensive technologies. This is a misconception and um, in, in contrast to that we can actually achieve major energy savings by adopting common sense behavior change approach 
uh, or looking at low cost or even no cost interventions. And then also a, a driver for energy cost rather than energy uh, quantum of energy is the time of use. Um, the graphic at the bottom right here is from our grid supply ESCOM again. Uh, on a time of use tariff, the green indicates when energy is the least expensive and the red most expensive during peak times. So in theory, if we manage to get our laundry staff to only uh, run the laundry on Sundays and, and uh, Saturday, a large part of the day or, or during the middle of the night on weekdays, we would be saving large amounts of energy cost, uh, even if we're not actually saving units of energy. All right, a couple of practical uh, quick steps on how in the hospitality industry to save energy. Switching off, avoiding heating and cooling where we can, Preventative maintenance goes a long way to reduce the, the energy footprint of components because they're running more efficiently. Um, if we think about pumps, for example, they require uh, regular maintenance, otherwise uh, bearings might seize and the motor has to run harder to keep the pump, pump going. Rethinking um, as a general concept, and that can be applied in a myriad of different ways across an operation. Zoning of lighting, uh, the lighting levels. Do we really have to have uh, massive amounts of lighting in various spaces? Can we not reduce that? Um, specifying and procuring or retrofitting and replacing energy efficient appliances and system controls. What can be on a timer? How can we set back a, a temperature set point? All of those aspects are, are quite important to consider. Okay, with that bit of theoretical background, um, some of the interventions that were looked at at Hotel Verdi. Here's just some images of what the hotel looks like. All right, so uh, we were fortunate enough to be part of the design and development of this hotel from the very early stages. So what we're not dealing with in this specific case study is a, is a retrofit program, but we are dealing with a uh, operation or a hotel that has now been in operation for nearly seven years, August 2013, and that has since committed, or from the beginning really committed to both, um, being designed and developed and built as Africa's greenest hotel, but also to, to position themselves on a sustainability journey of ongoing learning to make sure that they run as efficiently as possible and when a um, viable new more efficient technology presents itself to also pursue that. So just uh, please keep that in mind. It was a new build and we were able to uh, include a whole lot of technologies because um, we were there from the onset, which might not be possible on a retrofit, but um, sustainability should be a, a journey and an ongoing improvement target, even if it has been a new build. And, and this is really one of the ex really exciting things about this uh, hotel at the Cape Town Airport, um, that they take that uh, seriously. So the mandate from the client at the time was to uh, was really twofold in essence, much more detail, but two main uh, points that I want to bring across this morning. The first one is that we are to showcase that we can build, uh, help them build Africa's greenest hotel. And the second one is to simultaneously showcase that luxury and sustainability are not actually mutually exclusive, but can coexist and can coexist really well. So one of the aspects that we considered, as I mentioned in that pyramid earlier, uh, was the passive design interventions. What could be done to minimize heat load and cooling load on the building without uh, efficient technology, but rather through careful design of the envelope of the building. So we conducted um, very careful and detailed uh, so-called energy uh, performance modeling, um, where we simulated a, a 3D uh, instance of the hotel in a uh, high-tech software and ran that in the Cape Town um, uh, geography and um, uh, cl con climate context across a typical weather year. So we were able to determine the sun angle, the, um, the heat loading on that building, and as a result, understand what passive interventions would yield great energy savings. And here's just a couple of examples. So on the left hand side, we see uh, photovoltaic panels that don't just produce renewable energy. We'll get to that shortly, but they also, because they're on the Northern facade, being in the Southern hemisphere, that is the uh, facade that receives the most um, sunlight. Um, they actually provide shading. You can see that quite clearly here. Um, in summer where the sun angle is steeper in, in Cape Town, when most locations actually, uh, most of the guest room windows would be shaded. And in winter where the sun angle is shallower, closer to the horizon, actually uh, sun 
can hit those windows and help passively warm those rooms. So we're benefiting in both the summer season and in the winter season. Then in the middle of the photo here is the, uh, the area above the reception and waiting lounge uh, where we decided to have a green roof and plant um, various uh, indigenous um, species of plants. And you can see with time this really flourished and that sandwich of um, drainage layer, soil, and then um, the plants are a very good insulator, keeping the spaces below cooler in summer, warm in winter, and in summer as well, the plants, uh, because they perspire or, um, over their leaves, evaporative cooling also happens, helping to cool the spaces below. Then on the right-hand side, we're looking at an image of um, the, the roofing being installed, and what you can see here is a, is a relatively for at least for the South African context, a relatively uh, high spec um, insulation material that was provided to uh, keep um, the summer heat. We're in a predominantly cooling dominated environment. That means we have a hotter summer than we have a colder winter. So that was quite important, but also important for both seasons, of course, uh, to keep the, uh, the heat out in summer and um, heat in in winter while at the same time looking at uh, reducing the acoustic uh, um, impact on the rooms below the roof being so close to the airport. And as you can see, some roof sheeting here is a very bright color. It has a high SRI index, solar reflectance index, um, which means that a lot of the incoming solar radiation is actually reflected back out to space and is the reason why some of the installers are wearing um, uh, sun, uh, sunshades um, during the installation. Okay, so then a couple of uh, energy efficient um, technologies that were installed. We have a geothermal or geo exchange field below the basement footprint of the hotel. In essence, 100 boreholes were drilled into the ground. They're each about 65 meters deep. Um, a U bend of pipe was installed into those holes that goes down and comes back up. The pipe work was connected together horizontally in a very specific way. And we now have about 13 kilometers of high density polyethylene um, hardware and pipe uh, in the ground that we can use as a heat exchanger. That is coupled with the hyper efficient heating, ventilation, air conditioning system uh, that is based on, on heat pump technology. And uh, rather than rejecting heat evaporatively, which uses a lot of uh, water, or through dry coolers, which uses a lot of energy into the atmosphere, we actually exchange heat with the ground, which is much more energy efficient. Um, and uh, therefore our heating and air conditioning system is, is really um, of the utmost efficiency in the African context. Um, good, the envelope we already talked about and then a lot of attention was paid to the lighting system um, that was predominantly LED, which is currently the most efficient lighting technology, but also controls from uh, motion sensors on security and perimeter um, lighting, as well as day-night um, switches to motion sensors in public spaces, key card activated um, lighting in the rooms and, and conference facilities, um, and timers for, for various other lights as well, to make sure that lights are only on when they're needed and only as bright as they, as they need it. So lots of dimming functions as well. And in some areas uh, we do so-called daylight harvesting, where natural, uh, um, the, the facade is designed to allow maximum amount of uh, natural light coming in. Um, and in turn, artificial lighting is dimmed when the natural lighting levels is high enough. Some um, of the interventions on the alternative energy side, basically what we're looking at on the top left here is regenerative lifts, um, which at the time was the first installation on the African continent. In, in essence, um, when gravity is doing the work for the, for the lifts, which is uh, when the cabin is full and traveling down, uh, the cabin with, with occupants is heavier than the counterweight, or when the cabin is empty, traveling up the counterweight that is attached via a steel wire um, is now heavier and wants to pull the cabin up. So in those two conditions, gravity is in essence doing the work. Uh, that effect of gravity is harnessed through the drive motor, which uh, acts as a generator, and the energy, roughly 30% of the input energy is, is harnessed and um, inserted back into the building's grid. There is uh, three wind turbines installed outside the reception uh, that, that also generate uh, in total nine kilowatts of power. The power generating gym equipment is quite an interesting one. It doesn't contribute greatly in terms of uh, this 12%, um, sorry, all of these four interventions together 
uh, contribute 12% of the building's energy mix. Um, and the power generating gym equipment is a, is a minor portion of that. But it is really a great uh, way to demonstrate to visitors and guests how difficult it is to, to generate a usable amount of energy and how easy to squander that. So there's some sign, um, signs around the gym which, for example, uh, tell the guests that they would have to exercise on average about an hour to generate enough energy to heat up hot water for their morning coffee or enough energy to uh, make a toast. So after an hour worth of blood, sweat and tears, one has simply generated half of one's breakfast and, and that hopefully gets the point across and hopefully has a ripple effect uh, outwards in, in behavior change of guests, visitors, staff members, etc. Um, to, to be more responsible in their own energy usage. The PV panels that I mentioned, not just on the northern facade, but also on the north facing roof, um, is the biggest contributor to this 12%. And, and just to let you understand why 12% only, um, the, the bulk of the time, effort and budget for energy efficiency was spent on passive design interventions and uh, um, high efficiency technologies rather than simply going ahead and oversizing or, or having very large um, renewable energy systems on the roof budget was by then spent. Um, but uh, also as per that pyramid that we talked about earlier, the more responsible route. Okay, um, don't worry about not being able to distinguish all of the graphs, but basically what I'm trying to demonstrate here is uh, this is the baseline uh, intensity of energy use over a year, um, which was modeled according to uh, the American um, Green Building Program, LEAD, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, one of the certification schemes that the hotel achieved. So this was the total benchmark through the passive interventions that we um, brought on board with the architect. About 2.6% was saved. That was the glazing specification, the insulation, uh, the shading devices. It is that little because the LEAD benchmark is quite a stringent one coming from the US. Internal load reduction through the electrical engineer, that's the lighting specifications, uh, the lighting control and other uh, efficiency specs on various technologies. Mechanical engineer, a big saving here, as you can see, that is uh, as a result of the hyper efficient um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system that relied on the ground source heat pumps. And then what we mean with client here is a further bolstering of the total um, through renewable energy means. So. In comparison to the lead benchmark, we were or we are modeled to be 51% more efficient. How it turns out in reality, um, we can see South African standards over here, a energy use intensity, which is measured in kilowatt hours per square meter per annum or per year, um, is allowed, or hotel in South Africa is allowed to have 600 uh, units. Um, the Cape Town average, because the standard is extremely outdated and poor or non-stringent, uh, Cape Town Average Hotel, in that was a 2008 study, came in at about 255. The lead model that we talked about uh, moments ago at about 160, and then the hotel is actually operating at about 93. And you might think, oh, you said just now about 50% more efficient. Uh, this isn't quite 50%, and that is because the model at the time was based on 60% occupancy. And uh, to everyone's um, joy, the hotel is running much more uh, with a much higher occupancy than that, about on average 80% before the pandemic, I have to admit. Um, and that's why this number is a bit higher than we modeled. But still, the results are really good and very promising. In comparison, a typical European hotel, anything between 200 and 400. Um, and then in the US, we're looking at close to 600 even, much more energy intensive buildings uh, there. Partially to do with climate and other factors as well, but just uh, to give you some useful numbers to compare. All right, so what this energy modeling also told us um, and some of the other uh, interventions is that we should think about how to use our building in practice or in operation. And an interesting one um, that we implemented is which rooms to, uh, to assign a higher priority to when booking in the various seasons. Um, so in winter, looking at the bottom right here, the highest priority should be given to the north facing rooms because th those are the most energy efficient. Um, and in turn, in summer, um, the rooms on the south facing facade makes obvious, obvious sense um, that that is an inverted would be the highest priority because those are the most efficient. So uh, something that we can, the learning uh, that we can take from design and construction activities, we should also often look at opportunities to bring them into our operation. 
Okay, so this is um, a screenshot from, from a commitment or a, or a um, graphic uh, from the hotel itself. This is their, their graphic. And here they commit to that journey of sustainability, um, where planning and design was very thoughtfully and extensively done during the des design ahead of construction. This simply also applies to retrofits, uh, ongoing operation and maintenance, and then a, a circular optimization loop where we continue to do this as new technology emerges, as new operating practices and principles emerge. Um, this is continuously being reconsidered or refreshed. All right, so just wanted to highlight that optimization is an ongoing exercise. Then something um, to uh, also share with you what they do from an operational point of view is to communicate quite heavily with the guest, not in your face and not an overwhelming way, but um, in a lot of places, subtle sign, signs on walls uh, and, and next to interventions, uh, as well as on the IPTV network and in the uh, marketing collateral. Um, so the guests can really go through the hotel and learn about what was being done, but it's, it's not overwhelming should they choose not to uh, do so. So one of them is uh, for the guests to use the power generating gym equipment uh, while having fun and also earning a Vadina, which is an in-house currency, a reward program that is uh, dispensed not necessarily for return guests, but more so for guests that actually participate in the more environmentally friendly behaviors and activities. So that is using the power generating gym equipment, uh, carpooling to arrive at the hotel, using the outdoor gym equipment, using the stairs rather than the elevators and many more such interventions. Another quite interesting um, uh, program at the hotel is the carbon neutral experience, both for a stay, so a room night, as well as a conferencing experience. The experience is entirely carbon neutral so all of the energy efficiency interventions resulted in a much smaller carbon footprint of the hotel than a typical Cape Town or other hotel that we just looked at, but it isn't entirely carbon neutral. The balance was quantified and carefully calculated and is being offset through um, so-called micro uh, certificates um, of a fully credible and, and accredited program. Um, and the balance is therefore offset making both the, as I mentioned, room nights and um, the conferencing experience to completely carbon neutral. Okay, we're moving into water. All right, just a brief um, problem definition. The United Nations World Water Assessment Program reinforces the importance of water for sustainable development through these words. I'm going to quote, water resources and the range of services they provide underpin poverty reduction, economic growth and environmental sustainability. From food and energy security to human and environmental health, water contributes towards improvements in social well-being and inclusive growth, affecting the livelihoods of billions. Um, the United Nations um, uh, also works on the um, Sustainable Development Goals, as most of you probably know, um, and, and obviously water plays a, a massive part in, in that and um, in three main pillars, social, economic and environmental. And there is a handful of um, UN SDGs that are affected through water um, from good health and well-being to gender equality, clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, and obviously life below water. Um, I don't have time to go into each of them, but I encourage you to just look at what each of these SDGs stand for and how their relationship with water uh, works. Okay, the concept of water footprinting is something that I also just want to briefly touch on. And in essence, what we, what we mean with that is um, basically all of the water that was consumed uh, in, the, in, in whatever we're measuring. We can look at the water footprint of a company, of a country, uh, or of a product. And in essence, what, we, what we're measuring here is the total water that is, is used, consumed, or polluted. Um, to produce that product or to run that company or to uh, keep that nation going. And it's made up of three different components, green, which is uh, from precipitation, uh, blue, which is water sources, groundwater or, or um, surface water, and then gray is what is required through to assimilate pollutants um, uh, to, to meet certain water quality standards. And I've just got a couple of interesting uh, comparisons for you here. 
the typical liter bottle of um, bottled water has a water footprint of about 1.4. That difference of one liter in the bottle and 0.4 goes into rinsing the bottle and producing the, the plastic bottle. A cotton t-shirt, um, quite shocking, about 2,700 liters of water for one cotton t-shirt. A portion of um, beef, about 1,900 liters. The coffee that I just finished, about 140 liters. Um, the bulk of that obviously goes into the growing of, of the coffee beans and then a portion of vegetables, uh, for example, 45 liters. I'm not mentioning these to try and convert all of you to vegetarians. And um, what I'm trying to do here is simply to instill a deeper level of thinking about our actions and our consumption patterns and, and uh, the ripple effects that that has on, in this case, water, but obviously much more than that as well. Brief overview of a couple of um, uh, or of the world's nations and their water footprint. Um, in many instances, industrialized nations have a higher footprint. Um, and then there's a couple of exemptions. I think this is Mongolia over here and uh, some areas in the Sahara Desert. Those are usually, as far as I understand, linked to being very arid regions and therefore um, most of the population relies more heavily in the uh, the sustenance on on meat or animal products which have a higher um, water footprint than uh, vegetables or plant-based uh, um, um, sorry uh, um, nutritions do so that's an in interesting one but by far the biggest um, total uh, water footprint comes from the United States okay the concept of a water balance um, very briefly is is matching as responsibly as possible the various water demands with the available water sources um, and their respective quantity and quality requirements. Um, for us, that is a very important um, check and, and, and balance to conduct during the early stages of a design or when a big program uh, is to be undertaken to reduce, uh, so to audit and to reduce water consumption in an existing building, is first to understand what sources and what uses of water do we have and then match them up as responsibly as possible. End uses of water in hotels is mostly made up by the guest rooms, uh, followed by um, laundry and um, landscaping, and then, um, uh, sorry, the kitchen, obviously a big one, and cooling and heating if there is evaporative cooling um, or heating in the building. So while the tourism industry is by far not the biggest consumer of water, in a typical um, economy. Um, I just wanted to briefly point a few things out to consider. So typically popular tourist destinations are located in warmer regions and in, in lower rainfall regions or especially um, the peak tourist season is during the lower rainfall season. Um, so there's an annual or seasonal influx of tourists that massively increase the demand beyond the normal requirements of residents and the capacity of local water sources. So because of this, um, and especially in more remote areas, hospitality operations can actually become the main consumer of water, um, at least for some periods of the year, depending obviously on context and, and location. All right, that became very clear to us um, in Cape Town. Many of you would have probably read about our water crisis or our near water crisis, our, our multiple year drought that we had in relatively recent years. Um, and it has a massive impact on the hospitality experience. Uh, water restrictions could result in dissatisfied guests and um, therefore it's you know, everyone's responsibility to main, maintain adequate water comfort uh, to make sure that guests feel free to arrive at your destination and feel comfortable there. Um, and, and as a result of a water crisis or a drought, also purchasing of water and disposal of uh, sewage or other uh, polluted water sources is becoming increasingly expensive. So just a brief um, summary of what happened to us in Cape Town. The peak of the drought was uh, during the beginning of 2018 um, and that had a massive ripple effect on the media that portrayed Cape Town in a, in a less optimal light and maybe not as the best uh, you know, tourist destination for some time and we saw that quite clearly in the year-on-year -year figures of uh, arrivals in, from our biggest um, uh, uh, markets. And you can see that even though the, the peak of the drought was in 2018, 
that really sunk in with travelers during the latter half of 2018 and 2019, where our numbers were quite significantly reduced. And our growth pattern, you can see here, as the, the drought emerged uh, late 2017 and into 2018, um, our growth of tourism considerably reduced as well. So water playing a massive part in driving um, uh, hospitality uh, arrivals as well. Okay, a couple of points of water conservation in hotels. Um, uh, yeah, so from landscaping, use of grey water, uh, leak repairing and awareness. Um, I want to move on to a water management strategy. That, that is a, a multiple tiered approach that goes from planning into metering, um, cost benefit analysis, defining an action plan, monitoring, training staff, and then also creating customer awareness is the most responsible way of going about a water management initiative. And then surprisingly, or actually uh, many of you might know this, but many water saving technologies and interventions have a very short payback period, especially where those interventions also um, save on energy. For example, low flow shower heads is a very uh, low payback or short payback period because it consumes not just, or it saves on the consumption of water as well as hot water, meaning energy consumption. Okay, diving into the case study of Hotel Verdi again. Uh, what we basically implemented here is, uh, this is a so-called natural pool, um, which doesn't rely on any chemicals, no chlorine or hydrochloric acid to keep the water clean, but rather um, a very careful selection of different species of plants around the perimeter that each do their part and filter out various contaminants. Um, that makes the system much more resilient to water consumption. Uh, there's not as much uh, filter cleaning and backwashing that's required, only really occasionally to, to vacuum any uh, sediment off the floor. And there is a filter, filtration system which runs a tenth of the time as a conventional pool. If that filter is, does become dirty, it gets backwashed into this thousand litre tank that you see over here, which is allowed to settle, the water is allowed to settle in there and about 950 litres of that thing gets reintroduced into the pool and only the bottom 50 litres with uh, the sediment is then discarded. It's a very novel way of using the pool system. Laundry use, reuse, sorry, um, the, you can see the laundry equipment here. In essence, what happens is that the, the water from the last rinse cycle is stored in this tank um, above the machines and is then reused in the next loads uh, pre-rinse cycle to reduce the, the total water consumption. Low flow fittings throughout the hotel in public and guest rooms um, from shower heads to basin mixes, etc. Uh, waterless urinals, the toilets are flushed with recycled grey water and the irrigation um, is with drip irrigation um, throughout. Rainwater is captured at the hotel and filtered passively through this self-cleaning filter before it's stored underground in this 40,000 litre um, storage tank, which is also topped up with any subsoil drainage water that uh, is dewatered out of the basement on a more or less ongoing basis. And then, as I mentioned, grey water is recycled in a completely biological way. Uh, that again means no chemicals is used in the process, um, but in an anaerobic digestion um, procedure with the final stage of UV light that sterilizes to result in colorless and odorless uh, water for toilet flushing. A few more interventions. Um, On-site water purifications is one of the machines there, which uh, means that there is much less plastic waste from, from uh, single-use bottles. Um, but also that water footprint, the difference between one, one litre in the bottle and 1.4 litre water footprint is, is thus avoided. Um, Beyond Tap has a lower water footprint because the bottles don't have to be produced and, and rinsed before the bottling process. There is careful submetering throughout the hotel so we understand where consumption or potential leaks are happening. And then all of the vegetation is either indigenous or endemic, meaning it is as water efficient as possible. Um, unless it is used for production. So there's some vegetables that are being planted and some fruit trees. Uh, those are obviously in some cases not indigenous or endemic. Then behavior change which, uh, or, or awareness raising, which uh, became much more pronounced during our drought, um, but is an ongoing exercise as well. Um, there is interventions there. For example, uh, pot plants being introduced into the bathtubs and the plug uh, removed so that guests um, are discouraged from using the bath, but rather the shower. Um, very interesting interventions here. 
um, basically a, a small a credit was posted onto the bill if a guest orders a soft drink without the glass and ice uh, because that saves obviously the the washing of the glass and the water and the ice um, and I think it was a two South African Rand saving so not a big amount but an actual bigger saving for the guests than it costs the hotel to post uh, to, to save that um, water. And then uh, several other um, awareness campaigns throughout the hotel during the drought just to drive home the point um, and some really interesting alternatives as well. So during the height of the drought, when it looked like South Africa, sorry, Cape Town would literally run out of water and taps would run dry, um, the hotel stepped up their campaign and introduced uh, paper napkins and, and, and um, disposable plates for a short period of time because those had already been produced and mostly produced in a, in a different province. Um, so the water footprint would be experienced elsewhere reducing the demand for, for the dishwashing machines in Cape Town where the height of the drought was being experienced. So an offsetting exercise to try and do uh, that, you know, the hotel was trying to do their part to reduce um, the demand on the Cape Town water reserves. There's a few more uh, small interventions that I think for the interest of time, I will not um, run through, but there is an interesting one that I just want to highlight. Um, again, those Bodinos, where, where guests were reusing the tiles or where um, some of the um, tile pillows, sorry, that were placed in the room were put aside and, and extra tiles were put aside and not touched by the guests or not used by the guest so that they can be, um, so that they didn't need to be laundered at the end of their stay. Um, and just to share with you some of the performance um, statistics, what we're looking at in the blue graphs over here is um, the total municipal water consumption of the hotel. Um, and overlaid is the occupancy pattern. So you can see a, a faint correlation between occupancy or, or relatively um, clear correlation between occupancy and water consumption. But what's more interesting is that we see a trend um, downwards. Even the hotel was built, designed and built to be as water efficient as we could at the time. It, this trend continued uh, considerably because of the heightened awareness and uh, also staff participation um, in driving down water demand as a result of the water crisis. And many of these interventions have actually stayed in the hotel, not quite as much uh, awareness campaigns, but still it's, it's quite a prominent feature. So we're hoping that this lowered uh, consumption will remain in place. Yeah, so we're quite proud of this one. Decoupling um, occupancy from, from consumption uh, was, was really a good achievement, especially when needed most during the drought. Okay, I'm moving into waste. Again, a brief theoretical introduction before we look at what Hotel Verdi did. Um, I just want to yeah, raise the concept or, or ask the question of what is away. We throw something away, but what is away? Where does it go? Especially when we think about plastic products that don't decompose over uh, hundreds of years. Um, away really is an interesting concept and doesn't exist. Nature knows no waste, nature doesn't have in a way, everything is a cyclical process and nothing uh, ends up looking like these tires at the bottom of a, of a, a lake or, or the ocean. So um, the hospitality industry has obviously expanded un in unprecedented ways over, over the recent decades um, across all corners of the globe and therefore has direct pressures on non-renewable resources both in the design and construction phase and in the operation occupancy phase of hotel properties. On average, and this is really interesting to keep in mind, hotel guests generate one kilogram of waste per guest night in the form of paper, plastics, cardboard, food waste, etc. So quite a large amount per night. That is mostly um, uh, just divided up as follows, but mostly goes into food waste. Um, paper is, is the next, next biggest one, cardboard, um, uh, close to 10%, plastics 10 to 15, glass about 10 to 14, and then the rest altogether about 13. And the other, just to keep in mind, uh, deals with hazardous wastes as well as um, electronic waste, which is an important category for us to be aware of. I just want to briefly pause on food waste because it's usually the biggest contributor. Um, food waste in itself is broken down in this way. The bulk of that is um, as a result of the purchase um, sorry, the, the, the cost uh, of food waste uh, is 
mostly as a result of the food that we purchase and, uh, and discard, the labor that goes into producing food which goes to waste, the energy that goes into producing food that goes to waste, the waste management costs attached to the, the wasted food, the ad administration, some water and transport. So um, this just briefly to highlight that there's actually considerable uh, various metrics um, that go into driving the cost of, of waste as well and specifically food waste and where that all comes from and if we have an understanding of what that is all made up of we have a better ability to start mitigating um, both the the amount of waste as well as the cost of that waste so um, eco procurement i believe is a massive contributor towards uh, minimizing waste um, and eco-procurement is choosing products and services with the lowest negative impact on the environment while minimizing waste. So we don't just want to offset one um, product for another that has less waste, but we want to do so while making sure the specifications of the product and the composition of that product has a minimal uh, negative impact on the environment as well. And really it lies uh, where these two areas intersect. Um, the, the management systems and the products itself where they intersect, that's where we find uh, green procurement. Um, yeah, there's a couple of strategies, reducing, and one could consider opting in versus opting out. So giving the guests the uh, opportunity to say I want something rather than uh, saying they don't want something because unless they make an active step, then the waste is, is automatically generated. So opting in is much more effective reusing in a practical way, uh, recycling, um, but rather prioritizing um, upside, upcycling than downcycling. So producing something that is of more value than the original product, then something that is of lesser value. And, and then implementing a recycling program within the hotel. And just briefly glance over this interesting pyramid over here that, um, that ranks various waste interventions or waste principles by the uh, sustainability um, and obviously we want to avoid, we want to look up here, um, we want to avoid prevention um, of waste as much as possible. And then I encourage all of you to look into the concept of circular economy, which plays a massive role in, in waste minimization or avoidance where there's a cyclical approach and we only top up with raw materials rather than a linear consumption pattern, which is uh, what most economies are still unfortunately in. Um, obviously some recycling helps to reduce this, uh, the impact of the linear approach, but a circular, circular economy much more effective in the long run. Yeah, the uh, much taunted um, R's in um, waste reduction are, are quite true. Um, and just a couple of points there. Saying no to plastic aspects, especially straws, an easy one, choosing reusable products, um, avoiding single-use items, rethinking amenities, um, not printing and accessing of, um, assessing, sorry, one's procurement processes, and then donate unwanted items. Uh, I, I briefly want to, before again moving to Hotel Verde, I just want to briefly uh, leave with all of you individuals um, the concept of, of clogging, um, which is jogging and picking up litter at the same time. Um, and also when one enjoys a walk at the beach, take a packet along and, and pick up the rubbish that uh, you find. Uh, we're currently in Plastic Free July, which is a really support worthy campaign to minimize individuals um, plastic usage specifically during the month of July and then hopefully uh, bring that um, into life also in the ele other 11 months. But I just want to highlight that while I, I fully support all of these initiatives and they're really important, these are end of pipe solutions. They're dealing with the waste that has already arisen. Um, I want to rather focus, rather encourage you to focus harder on um, often more difficult um, process-based ones, the procurement process and the avoidance um, methodologies that minimize this kind of waste from arriving in the first place. Okay, Hotel Verdi. Okay, waste diverted um, is an interesting and important metric um, and the performance at Hotel Valley has increased over time. Uh, there was a couple of particularly good months and then a change in procedures uh, and recycling contractor which resulted in some um, 
checkered, not checkered, they're still above 90, but some not as great um, results. And then I think they're busy bringing that all back on board. But uh, just wanted to highlight the point here, an upward trend, which is great. Some really high performance during 2017, early 2018. And then to be quite aware of any um, decisions on, on uh, one's partners, uh, in this case, the contractor, that might result in some uh, changes and, and careful monitoring has to be implemented. Um, waste diversion is basically in South Africa, uh, a lot of our waste goes to landfill, which fast running out of landfill space, but it is unfortunately in many cases, anything that can't be avoided, donated, composted or recycled has to still go to landfill. There's no other means in many instances. Um, and this here is the percentage of what is diverted versus the last bit, uh, a couple of percent that still goes to landfill. What is also really important and is omitted in this picture, yeah, but shown in this one is the total amount of waste. So even if something can be composted or recycled, it still has an impact. It was produced and it results in something that isn't optimal. Um, usually downcycling exercise, for example, plastic bottles end up as insulation material. So usually downcycling exercise. So we want to avoid waste. And the picture that we're looking at here uh, in green, again, the occupancy figures, and in blue, the total quantum of waste um, generated by the hotel. Now we're really looking at a waste campaign that has been exceptionally effective, where through careful attention to the procurement program and various other initiatives, the total quantum of waste that is generated at the hotel uh, is significantly reduced over time. Um, and we're looking at August last year, where it's about a third of what we were producing just uh, four years prior if not almost a quarter. So those results are really encouraging and partially also play a role. I'm just going to skip back one slide why these results of waste diverted are not as great because it's much harder to um, divert as much percentage of a much smaller amount of waste. So we've avoided the, the, uh, a lot of the unnecessary waste already and therefore what remains is often unavoidable going to landfill and therefore making it more difficult to divert. I hope that uh, concept makes sense and that's all of you encouraged to to look at the various businesses or homes or, or, or um, other operations that you have control or input over to, to also decouple, uh, sorry, to also minimize total waste generation. Okay, this is just some of the stats on, on various waste streams and uh, I'm just putting this up just to show you that the hotel tracks uh, quite a few number of different waste streams rather than just uh, a handful makes it easier to understand where those um, items are coming from and how to minimize them individually. Um, waste breakdown is tracked into quite, in quite a bit of detail and in, in what we're looking at here is food waste, which is matched against the number of covers so that the restaurant and, and kitchen team can try and understand that better as well. Um, and as you can see here by this linear um, trend line, the food waste is also greatly reduced over time. Okay, at the hotel, um, going to landfill, I think we looked at the statistic earlier, one kilogram of waste per person per guest night at the uh, hotel value, it's one, uh, 0 0.14 kilograms. Um, so a great statistic um, and result for us, but something that we're uh, targeting on an ongoing basis. Uh, interesting campaign, it's not the best photo, apologies, but what we're looking here at here is a suitcase uh, that has a, by now a much bigger poster on it that encourages guests to leave behind all of the unwanted uh, items from the from the stay in Cape Town at the hotel. Uh, sometimes there's towels, sometimes there's beach um, paraphernalia, sometimes shoes, as you can see right now, the guests leave behind here rather than throwing away or, or um, trying to donate quickly and, and not finding a suitable um, cause. The hotel basically accepts all of them, collates that, and on a regular basis then takes them to a worthy uh, shelter that, that requires all of these products um, and accepts them gladly. So a nice campaign and, and encourages guests not to waste, but to, to give it for a worthy cause. And then my last slide that I want to share with you is uh, staff empowerment, not just in the waste campaign, but in all of the campaigns, energy, water, um, and various others. Uh, staff empowerment is a really key aspect to to bring about um, more effective campaigns, um, giving the, the staff create the, the space to be creative, to come up with ideas, autonomy, uh, budgets, um, putting uh, sustainability campaigns on their KPIs, 
really um, drive a culture of, of sustainability awareness and effort in the, in, in the operation. Um, and a, and a sub-team uh, that was found at the, the Green Guardians uh, that we're looking at, the uh, key representatives here, made up um, of both um, HODs, managers, uh, basically, and line staff, uh, is quite a powerful tool to, to drive that throughout the uh, operation and keep other staff members honest and participating and um, aware of what's happening. Um, yeah, and there's also rewarding um, uh, rewards for them so uh, members that participate in here and come up with great ideas can can win uh, prizes or can um, join uh, exciting um, outings so it really makes sense to to implement this with the staff as effective as possible and to listen to the staff so um, suggestion boxes are in the hotel to uh, ask for for input um, and yeah and just really make this a, a staff owned initiative Good, I'm drawing to a close. Uh, we'll have obviously some time for question and answers now. Um, I encourage all of you to just post your questions, which I will run through quickly. Um, I haven't been keeping an eye on it. I was uh, looking at my notes and, and the screen obviously, but I'm just gonna browse through. And then I also, after we're done with Q&A, which is roughly 10 minutes, if there is enough questions for that, um, I want to hand back to Alyssa to, to just take you through a bit more about Sumas in general. Um, all right, give me a quick second to look for the first question, but please continue posting your questions while I do so. Uh, da -da. Okay, the rewarding recording, sorry, has been handled. Um, okay. Okay, we're still talking about recording here. All right, Alexander, you said really good examples that could be adapted by other hospitality and tourism related establishments and even private homes. Okay, so thank you. That was just a comment and observation, not a, really a question. Um, I think I'm, I might be missing something, but I'm through the, the chat uh, box. Um, ah, okay, here's a question. Was the initial investment for the hotel compared to average investment for a usual hotel? That's also Alexander. Alexander, thank you. That's a really good question. And I get asked that fairly often. Um, so the, the investment at the hotel uh, was obviously somewhat more to, to make um, all of these in interventions and processes a reality. And uh, approximately 12% was spent uh, in additional capital during the design and development phase to make up uh, the various interventions. The bulk of that went into energy, intensive, uh, sorry, in energy efficiency uh, reduction um, systems like the hyper efficient heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, um, the higher spec glazing, the higher spec insulation materials, uh, the wind turbines, the uh, photovoltaic system. Um, but that 12.5% roughly, um, we, we track that by costing either the, the total intervention if it is not an intervention in a normal hotel. So for example, the photovoltaic array on the, on the roof and on the facade, the entire cost of that formed part of the green budget. And then the additional cost of um, the higher specification of glazing was added to that uh, green budget as well. And that all tallied up uh, into about 12.5%, um, which in RAND terms was about um, 20 million RAND out of the development budget. Um, I don't know offhand what that is in euros. It's probably about 1 million euro right now, if I remember the exchange rate correctly, uh, but I speak under correction. So this is also eight, eight seven, eight years ago. Um, and as a result of it being so long ago, uh, we were still at the relatively early stage of, of sustainability and green building practices in South Africa. So perhaps why it is a bit higher, the 12% than we know, or we now know from many other green building programs and, and projects. Uh, also a bit higher because we try to be a showcase for many technologies that might in, in their own right not have the best uh, return investment. The wind turbines, for example, uh, had a payback period of an excess of 20 years. No normal business decision would support such an initiative. Um, but yeah, it was 12 and a half percent. And interestingly enough, those 20 million rands um, that, we, that I was responsible for, for the green budget was won back in less than 18 months of operation through uh, free media and press exposure that can be uh, measured in, in a clipping, uh, with a clipping service that records and quantifies the value of a radio insert, a newspaper insert, a, uh, a screening of some sort, et cetera. And in the first 18 months, more free press exposure in various um, 
media platforms was given to the hotel because readerships and viewerships were, were interested in sustainability in the, in the South African context and journalists and news anchors wanted to report on it. So that was a really interesting um, uh, result, which we didn't anticipate. We, we anticipated some um, press exposure and the bulk of the green budget to be recuperated through energy, water uh, savings and other operational savings and not specifically through, through this one. So yeah, the, the payback period has been quite short if we look at um, the, the media benefit as well. Obviously we can't just assign the entire, um, uh, it was about 25 million Rand in the first 18 months. We can't assign the entirety of that in a normal um, comparison because the owner probably had it not be coming for free, wouldn't have um, spent so much on marketing. But I just want to make the point that some of that free press exposure can surely form part of the uh, re return on investment calculation. Hope that helps with the answer. Okay, what would be a low hanging fruit that pretty much any hotel could start doing to become more eco-friendly without great investment? All right, so that's also an interesting question. Um, it really depends on where on the sustainability journey uh, those hotels are on. If uh, Assuming that they've done very little, I would probably look at um, starting with a, a, a staff campaign. Um, usually that has very little cost, a bit of time, um, usually is a morale booster as well and, and helps productivity generally. Um, so a staff campaign and that staff campaign can start with uh, walk through audits and just look for opportunities. But if you want some actual interventions, I would start with water saving fittings, um, especially low, low flow shower heads, um, aerator tap fittings, and um, then also efficient lighting systems. Um, but I, I really encourage you not just to automatically think at uh, technology interventions, but operational interventions as well from switching off to reprogramming of timers and set points of water heating systems and other systems. Uh, those are very low cost interventions that with a bit of insight and understanding of those systems uh, can, can yield a lot of results. Okay. All right, Alexander, another question is how long was that initial investment recouped? Okay, so I think I touched on that um, in terms of energy and utility savings. In terms of energy and utility savings alone, uh, it is much longer than the 18 months that I mentioned. If I recall correctly, all of the energy interventions had a payback period of about five to seven years in, uh, together. And all of the water uh, efficiency interventions had a payback period of about eight to 10 years, a bit, a bit longer because water has historically been fairly cost effective here in, in South Africa. Uh, it has increased in cost recently a lot because of the drought, but it's still not quite um, true cost reflective. So if we look at only the utility savings, you know, somewhat longer, but if we factor in some of that PR exposure that I mentioned earlier, then, then the payback period is considerably less. All right. Um, okay, Christian, you asked, what am I doing at the moment? I'm currently giving a webinar to you. <laughs> no, um, sorry, that was just a joke. What I'm doing at the moment, I actually run a company called Ecolution Consulting. You can check us out on ecolution.co.za uh, and we are green building and sustainability consultants that offer our services to, to various design development projects or retrofit uh, projects or even business operations uh, and sustainability in, in the business as a whole. Um, we've had uh, the privilege of being uh, part of the team on some other hotel projects. For example, the Hotel Valley Zanzibar, the second hotel in the group um, that opened its doors in Zanzibar uh, just over a year ago. Um, we also assist several other hotels in, in the Cape Town context with ongoing sustainability interventions um, and then various other building typologies as well from commercial to industrial facilities um, across the continent, in fact. We're currently working on another hotel in, in Ethiopia. Um, we have a project, uh, a, a lodge project in Rwanda. Um, yeah, so we, we're quite busy. We're a team of, of eight people. Um, all right, we've got a question from Vinan. Uh, what eco-certification schemes for sustainability will I recommend for hotels in the region? So this is a really interesting one. Um, we often bring 
or we we specifically our consult my consulting firm brings specific knowledge of of a handful of certification schemes that aren't specifically focused on the hospitality industry um, we we work quite a lot with green star and lead which is the the green building ratings rating systems from south africa and the us um, respectively which look at uh, either design and construction aspects or operational aspects of any kind of building um, there are a couple of um, hospitality rating uh, or certifications that we've also dealt with in the past, uh, Green Globe, and we're current, currently looking at uh, Green Key for Hotel Verdi, um, because that is fairly extensively recognized on some of the uh, larger international booking platforms as a, as a, um, yeah, as a metric to, to tick and, and therefore filter. Um, and we've also been involved with fair trade um, tourism. Um, in, the, in the hospitality industry specifically. So it really depends on, on the target market, who one wants to um, reach and, and where one wants recognition for the certification. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of options. All right, so I'm just checking if there's other questions. Ah, were there any challenges? I would be lying if I said there weren't. There were a number of challenges. Um, uh, okay, so you've identified a few yourself, uh, dealing with local government, yes. Um, some of the interventions that we wanted to in incorporate at Hotel Verdi were quite novel, and um, local government and, and municipal approval uh, officials were not used to seeing them, so we had to engage with them quite carefully to make sure those were understood and, and endorsed. Um, employees, sure, a lack of understanding at times, and, and training was a really key one to to garner uh, employee engagement and, and participation and support. Um, guests, usually, or most of the time, the guests, the guests are really positive about what has been achieved at Hotel Verdi and, and the um, sustainability initiatives. Um, so I think less obstacles from the guests. We also sometimes had uh, challenges with procuring the right equipment at the time. As I mentioned, it's, it's now seven years since opening roughly. Um, eight, nine years since, since the early design stages, um, various efficient technologies were simply not available in the local market. And that made it quite challenging to, to specify what we wanted to. And sometimes um, we had to actually look abroad to procure the, the right technologies. Um, I'm just reading the rest of this question. In terms of changing mindsets, yes, ab absolutely, as we just discussed. Um, and how were they dealt with? Yeah, I think... Um, on, on staff, I think a lot of patience and training was key. Um, and then uh, what I mentioned here earlier with the staff empowerment, that was also a large one. Uh, getting the staff involved and excited about sustainability matters went a long way to, to get their input. And I think as the staff actually saw more and more of the free press exposure trickling into the hotel, um, more uh, more of that wow factor came about and more participation followed because they saw that they are part of something meaningful, something positive, something that is garnering international recognition. Various awards were won very, um, both locally and internationally. Um, the hotel was featured in, in media, you know, across the globe from London to Berlin to even some um, articles in the US. So, so as they saw more and more positivity regarding the business that they're involved with and the building that they're involved with and the operation that they're involved with, more and more support um, came. Um, yeah, I think those were some of the factors. Um, good, I see our, our 10 minutes Q&A has, has more or less come to an end and we're at the end of the question. So that is a good uh, yeah, coincidence. I think I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back to the SUMAS team. Yeah, second. Perfect. There Thank you, you so much, Andre. Um, it was a really insightful session, and uh, I hope uh, that all the attendees uh, are are inspired now to also uh, go on with uh, some of the changes that you suggested and some of the innovative ideas. <laughs> and I hope uh, so too. <laughs> thank you. And now let me tell you uh, a little bit more about Sumas. Uh, so, I will start sharing my screen. So, 
SUMAS was actually the first school to integrate the sustainability in its curriculum back in 2012, um, offering a wide uh, range of uh, programs starting from bachelor's and going all the way to the doctorate program. Um, now our mission is to educate uh, managers who will take responsible decisions in the complex world. Um, inspiring innovative leaders is what we're trying to do. <laughs> Uh, we have more than 30 nationalities presented across SUMAS programs and campuses, more than 20 languages spoken by our students, and 45% of female students, which we are quite proud of. Uh, we have campuses in Glan in Switzerland and in Milan in Italy. Milan is our newer campus that we just opened last year, and we're focusing more on uh, sustainable fashion in that campus. Uh, since we are located also in the heart of uh, design and art district uh, in Milan. So you can see our campus in Glan. So here in Glan, we are actually located uh, in a shared community with uh, the organizations like WWF, IUCN International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, and other um, big organizations that are working on nature conservation and biodiversity. So you can see some of the logos here. Ramsar as well. Um, we are located in two buildings. Uh, we have, so our uh, administrative part is here with all the organizations. And then we have a second building for the classrooms and student accommodation. And you can see some of the pictures of our Milan campus as well. That is also a shared building with uh, many companies that are working on sustainable fashion. So uh, we are actually able to participate in many sustainable fashion events. Uh, in January, our students participated in sustainable fashion show in Milan, uh, white uh, sustainable fashion events as well. Uh, so you can see it's also quite a shared experience. Uh, we also offer online programs uh, and that you can participate anywhere, anytime. <laughs> In terms of accreditation, we're internationally accredited with ACDSP. Uh, we're also in the Swiss private school register and we're part of United Nations Global Compact Initiative uh, and Principles for Responsible Management Education, uh, which uh, come in line with what our values are. So as I mentioned, we offer programs starting from actually IB, so International Baccalaureate Career Related Studies Program, going into bachelor, and uh, master, MBA, doctorate, and CAS, which is uh, short programs. Uh, all the graduate programs are offered both on campus and online. And uh, we have four uh, majors for bachelors, so sustainability management, which is more of a wider track, and then uh, finance, responsible investment, sustainable hospitality, and sustainable fashion. Uh, and the same goes for the master and the MBA, except for the MBA, you can also, uh, there's an additional uh, track that you can choose. So there's sustainable hospitality, sustainable tours, and sustainable fashion, finance and responsible investment. Part of uh, what makes SUMAS program so unique is also our experiential camps. Uh, so we went to Iceland, you can see some pictures here. This was ecotourism uh, program in Iceland. We went uh, also to Bhutan to uh, study the Gross National Happiness Program. We went to Costa Rica to learn about business and biodiversity. Um, last year we went to Thailand, so we, these experiential camps happen uh, every year. So uh, 2019 was Thailand. Uh, and uh, this year we will probably have a camp in Milan. Uh, another part of what makes our program special is professor-guided industry projects. Uh, when you're a student, you will be participating in, in uh, different projects that uh, we elaborate uh, with the uh, companies um, throughout, uh, in, in, from the whole world, really. Uh, and you can see some of the uh, examples here. We worked with the tire recycling solutions. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, MABA, which is one of the organizations here on the project of saving the tigers. Um, we worked with Worldwide uh, Wildlife Fund, WWF, which are here in this building, Procter & Gamble and uh, Oral-B. 
so really, really a wide range. Uh, you can learn more actually on our website. We have a, a whole page on the, all the projects that we've done so far. L'Occitane, Revlon, there was really a lot of different topics also on sustainability. Um, and uh, you can also, I wanted to mention also our alumni. They are working really throughout different industries, but all on the topic of sustainability. Um, you can see also a little bit about our student life because it's quite special here in Switzerland. Uh, they, it's very nature connected. They do a lot of activities um, around. It's beautiful for hiking. It's great if you like the outdoors sports. Um, our students go running a lot. Uh, Switzerland is a beautiful place to be also. If uh, you like history, there is a lot of uh, places to go uh, and visit for the tourism. And the same for Milan, obviously. Uh, it's a different type of experience. It's a, it's a big city. Um, but a very dynamic and international, um, but also full of students and student life. And uh, some of our alumni, you can also see here, working through in different industries, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, Philip Morris, um, local governments as well. Uh, and I probably mentioned some of these uh, points already, but uh, why Sumas? There is quite a few uh, points to speak about here, but uh, outstanding business education with a unique touch. So if you are interested in sustainability, this is your choice. Uh, it's becoming mainstream in the business world. All of the companies need sustainability specialists and we are quite unique in preparing sustainability specialists. Um, excellent relationship with industry partners. Something that I mentioned also about the project and uh, you will really get a practical experience, hands-on experience, and that's something that we also believe in, is that this is what we need to teach you, and uh, not just the theory, right? You need the practice. And we walk the talk. Only Sustainability Management School has a unique focus on sustainability at the core of our academic and organizational strategy. So if you have any questions, uh, please, you have uh, our email uh, in the chat as well. Don't hesitate to contact us. We'll be very happy to help you. Also, if you have additional questions to Andre, uh, we can also uh, put you in touch. And as we mentioned, the recording of this webinar will be sent to you um, in about a week time by email. So uh, if you want to rewatch it, uh, this can work as well. Um, thank you very much for participating in the webinar. And uh, thank you again, Andre. And uh, we hope that uh, we will have more webinars with you soon and uh, you can share more insights on the topic as well. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for attending as well. Thank you and have a nice day. <laughs>